Um, hello, everybody. My name is Nick Serrano. I'm on the um, lecture committee for the College of Art and Design. I'm a faculty member in landscape architecture. Um, in a moment here, I want to pass it over to Tracy, who is going to introduce our speaker and formally welcome everybody to the event. But I just wanted to go over first a few formalities in case uh, you have not been involved with the webinar before. Please don't be alarmed if you're in the audience and uh, cannot um, find your video or your audio link. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, which means only the panelists who you see the video feeds of um, at the top of your screen here have audio and video capabilities. Everybody else is welcome to join us live as the event's going on. I'm going to turn on um, closed captioning here in case anybody would appreciate that. I know I do. Um, so we welcome everybody here. Please participate in the discussion here through the chat function. Uh, the chat, anybody is able to post to the chat function and that's used mainly to converse amongst yourselves during the event. As the event goes along and you think of um, questions that intrigue you and that you'd like to pose for the Q&A section, please feel free to post them under the Q&A function, which should also be at the bottom of your screen. Um, I, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to get to everybody's question, but if you have one, we, we um, encourage you to post it there. And I believe Tracy will be moderating the Q&A session after Mr. Adeyemi's um, uh, uh, talk here in a moment. And that will be the method for doing that. I really do encourage you to post questions into the Q&A and then chat live under the chat functions. Mr. Adeyemi is not going to have the um, bandwidth, I assume, to monitor the chat while the lecture is going on. So don't, please don't expect him to respond to it at the, um, in live and uh, up to the moment, but use that more as a way to talk to amongst yourselves and, um, and um, perhaps many of us on the panel will also be able to monitor that as we're going along. So from now, I'm going to pass it over to um, Tracy Birch, who is, let me spotlight, uh, an assistant professor in, land, in architecture. Tracy, um, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Mr. Adeyemi, for coming um, to speak with us today. I, I truly appreciate it. Um, as a little bit of background, um, I am not an architect. I teach in a school of architecture, but I am not an architect. I'm actually an urbanist. Um, and I work with many communities in and around Louisiana that face issues related to flooding. And interestingly, I've worked with mayors who, who make statements like, we don't go to the water, we wait for the water to come to us. Yeah. The water in our communities is always something that's a relatively tragic experience and something we're generally not prepared for. Uh, and we often talk about living with water in the state of Louisiana, uh, but we tend to separate that water from our daily lives. We build walls and levees and we push it away from us rather than learning how to live with it. And so there's very much to be learned from the opposite approach, which is how do you learn to live in cities that are growing and that deal with water in them every day and that will deal with more water as time progresses. Um, so as an introduction to everybody who's here on the webinar, um, uh, Kunle Anayami is an internationally recognized architect, designer, and urban development researcher. Uh, he's the, founding, the founder and the principal of Enle, uh, which is an architecture design and urbanism practice. It was founded in 2010. Um, and this came on the heels of 10 years of working at OMA with Rem Goolhouse. Uh, notably, his work includes the Makoko Floating School, which has gone through numerous iterations to date, um, which has, has morphed into a more of a floating system, um, a way of thinking about living in, near, and on water, in fact, um, that has been deployed across the world. Um, uh, as I mentioned, he is an architect world-renowned, working with firms in both uh, Amsterdam and Lagos, Nigeria, uh, and a prolific urban researcher. He has um, 
I had the chance to see a lecture he did at Harvard University, uh, but has worked uh, at RISD, correct, uh, as well as other universities in the United States. Um, he works on broad topics that look at how to engage local and convert that or, or translate that into global systems, either through infrastructure and architecture. Uh, so I am thrilled to be able to introduce Mr. Adeyemi uh, for our first Manship Lecture Series um, speaker in the School of Architecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, would you like me to start right away? Yeah, okay. All right. Great. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see, one second. And okay. There we go. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And um, uh, thank you so much for uh, a very moving introduction, I would say. Um, I think your ability to have captured uh, the work that I'm about to present today in such a succinct way is really, really, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it makes me feel happy that we're actually able to share these um, ideas and that they they're coming together into a thread. So it's that thread that I would like to um, uh, introduce you today in, in the lecture called Water Cities. And I apologize for the typo in Louisiana. <laughs> uh, and uh, my practice um, is called Anle, which uh, means at home. And because a home in a Nigerian, in a, uh, Nigerian language is Yoruba, uh, is it means at home you know just it, it's it's the building block of any society that's what we believe the home is really the building block and um, if we have the capacity to develop cities uh, and make people feel at home in cities then and we think about our cities as homes i think there's a huge opportunity for uh, bringing together humanity and the environment. Um, and that's what we stand for, Lee. And we do that through innovation uh, in architecture and urbanism. Um, we do architecture, you know, as, you know, built form in buildings. We do urbanism. Uh, we do that through research uh, and looking at arts and culture. And uh, I'm just gonna go through very quickly some of our works, which uh, range from different scales, from furniture to urban scale. Uh, and I've also had a lot of experience working at, at OMA for several years, which was on large scale complex projects. And I started only at a time I was looking to bring some of these experiences back to uh, regions that seem to have um, challenges of and scarcity of resources and materials in the conventional way that we understand them to be, but looking at how we can use, uh, achieve maximum effects with minimum means, using economy of means, local resources and materials and things like that. Uh, so only was founded on that. We've done quite a, lot, a, a, a broad range of works in the last 10 years and um, this is a school in Tanzania, which is built in a village uh, called Karatu uh, that is in, you know, completely uh, remote area on the way to the Serengeti in Tanzania. And um, it's in a, you know, it's a, it's a school for about 240 pupils. Uh, and we, you know, the main thing about it is building with local materials, planning the entire campus, but also using very simple means to give architectural form and create space. Uh, these arches are made by giving the uh, builders a simple instruction to just hang a chain. And the curvature of that chain becomes the way they build. Um, so, you know, so the, with that simple rule, you can build different um, forms that are 
both accurate uh, technically, but also just uh, simple in terms of instructions. Um, we've also worked in, in New York uh, more recently, uh, a couple of years ago, when we did a pre Prelude to the Shed, which is a public space that um, can transform from a complete closed box um, to uh, it, an open public um, plaza. Um, so the chairs, you, you might not notice, but that we do that through um, what seemed like chairs at the ends of, the, of, of this image. You'd see something that looks like a very comfortable uh, sofa there. But these are the walls of the box, and then they sort of get enclosed. So you can transform the space between from a black box to an open stage by people just moving these chairs that are actually walls. Um, then we have also explored um, projects uh, really around the boundary of um, uh, intersection of water and edge conditions of cities. And this is a project in, um, uh, in Port Harcourt in Nigeria, which is uh, a radio station that sort of straddles land and water. So sort of an amphibious structure where the stage cascades to the waterfront and acts as a jetty. Um, it's not built yet, uh, but this is one project that we looked at that sort of infrastructure is also a radio station. So the structural system uh, is the mass for the radio station. Um, um, let's go into the next slide. Oh, sorry. So Water Cities um, is, is, a, is a concept that we are... Um, um, basically exploring, but also um, developing the ideologies around. Um, and that's simply this idea of the relationship between cities and water. And historically, that has uh, been the, you know, the, the foundation of human civilization. But somehow, we have increasingly uh, forgotten um, about that relationship and how we could utilize it. Um, and cities are built in ways that are very far from, let's say, uh, water sources. Um, so this is, a, water cities is that idea that we can start to sort of increase that relationship between cities and water where even your tall towers could be within the water fabric like, um, like you would have in, in Chicago uh, but, you know, you start moving further, you have places like Amsterdam, you have places like uh, Venice, and as you move further out, you can start to even have more lightweight floating structures, but everything integrated into a holistic living environment, uh, where you have, um, you know, recreational areas, a pool, uh, you know, uh, gardens, you know, you have play areas, schools, you know, hospitals, all the infrastructure you need, farm uh, places. Essentially, it's it, the idea is a vision um, to create nature-based solutions for smart, resilient cities. Cities that are smart in terms of you know integrate new technologies that are critical, but you know keep the base structure very simple and local. Um, and it's about climate action adaptation, uh, and you know a solution that leaves no one behind. It's inclusive of different social classes and uh, different um, trades uh, of, of, of life. Um, so this began, of course, um, at a time, this, this thought came to me, I think, uh, you know, um, somewhere around 2011, about nine years ago, when uh, we began researching uh, cities in Lagos, the city, the city of Lagos. Um, after I began only sort of within that framework. I've, I've actually had several relationships with Lagos from my schooling there to working there. Uh, but then going back into researching it, uh, I also did some of that with, with REM uh, at OMA, um, where, which was also where I, I met him. Um, so, but the fact is that, you know, the, for, for us, the, the, some of the in interesting findings about cities is that nearly 80% of all our major cities and 
capitals are by water. You know, it sounds, you would you'd think, well, that's, yeah, of course, but if you don't really stop to think about it, you wouldn't realize how many of our major cities and capitals, 80%. And it's said that nearly 50% of the human population are within those cities and coming closer to water. Um, and with the growth of the population, urbanization, people growing rapidly, people you know, trying to build the built environments, infrastructure, uh, the economy is, is thriving, our population is growing. And on the other hand, we have the, you know, the issues of climate change, where our cities are getting um, inundated, they're getting affected in some areas. The cities, 80% of these major cities are also um, some are quite within threatened zones. So uh, most significant population growths and climate impacts happen on the African and Asian continents. That's where you see, let's say the two points of collision of urbanization and climate change. Uh, so, like I mentioned earlier, it's no strange coincidence that most of our cities are by water. Uh, the history of human civilization has always begun next to water, as water is a source of life, water is, you know, place of transportation, agriculture, food, and, and all kinds of things. So, the Fertile Crescent, which is said to be the cradle of civilization, is, is also by um, the uh, um, waterfront. We've been amazing as a human civilization in creating cities, um, at least from a sort of built environment and just creating spaces. Um, have we taken enough time to understand what the environment itself requires to for for our better coexistence? I think. The storms, the first storm Sandy was a, a, a period that really shook, uh, I would say just you know, set a very important position in the world uh, about the impact of urbanization, growth of cities and climate change, which in this case is a storm related issue that basically it's an occurrence. Whether you think about it from a climate change perspective or simply that there is there are shifts in the weather patterns that are happening and they are affecting our major cities, then this uh, makes a huge change. And this was for me also uh, an important learning curve. And we see that not only in cities like New York, where you know, it's the epitome of uh, the growth of, of development of cities in many ways, you know, it's an archetype of a city. Um, we see that in, many other cities all over the world in india bangladesh uh, you know japan taiwan canada um, and uh, an image like this which suggests a, an existing city being flooded is is in a way becoming um not a too distant reality and this is the point where i also then ask why don't we instead of thinking about dealing with this situation, start to think about living like in these situations. Um, I think it's, it's an approach which is a mind shift to understand that the relationship between cities and water uh, would increase due to these implications of uh, changes in weather patterns. And instead of fighting it, can we, um, why can't we learn to live with it? Uh, and the way we've been dealing with the growth of cities is to reclaim land. And that in itself is very aggressive towards the water conditions and the entire sort of ecosystem. And even when it's well um, um, thought through and it's well engineered and it's, you know, the environmental impact is really, really great and they've worked it out the cost of that development is so high that it makes it very unaffordable for the average people. Um, so that model of development in itself is problematic, both economically and arguably environmentally. Um, so at the same time, we see a rising population of people living by water. Uh, 
uh, and I'll tell you, show you more about that soon. And um, we've seen those in a lot of settlements in a Africa and Asia. Uh, and uh, I think I'm, okay, yeah, in Africa and Asia, and we've seen a lot more even emerging, like very, very formal settlements in, in many parts of Asia. So we have very traditional uh, structures uh, in both parts of the world, but uh, now even more formalized conditions in uh, Asia, because they are somewhat ahead of that curve. Now, Africa is said to be one of the least responsible for climate change impacts, but it's one of the most affected by it with a large section of it within the high and extreme high risk zone. So uh, a lot of the African cities, are, you know, that also by water, like 70% are being threatened by these kinds of conditions. Uh, where cities are flooded um, and people are trying to get into it, get, you know, get out of it, walk into it, um, just now being really challenged. So this happened in 2011. And this was a very important turning point in my thinking about how to develop cities to tackle urbanization, but also realizing these cities were flooding. There was a huge flood. I was part of, I was there in Lagos on this day. And it was literally like a, an epiphany, you know, that, wow, places that we consider our land and they are, you know, roads and they're actually just going to be covered by water if we're not really thinking about this differently. At the same time, I also saw people beginning to engage that situation, uh, adapt, and they're resilient. They're really being inventive, creative, and like, you know, using resources like this is probably some abandoned boat that they had, and using poles, and, you know, and just having a great time and just taking it on. So the spirit of people, the average person, and their capacity for innovation, um, for me, is a driver at NLE where we want to harness that sort of energy and understand environments and then uh, adapt and use the power of adaptation and resilience to, to, to create and, and to innovate. I think that's also everywhere in the world. You know, we're seeing people having a great time in New Orleans. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's the same challenge, people trying to overcome cars, driving in their stuff, it's dangerous. But there's also that a spirit within humans, within us to adapt, to be resilient, to cope. So it gives, it gives us hope, it gives us hope that this ultimately is a, is a challenge that uh, us as humans, we have a lot of that capacity to, um, yeah, to um, evolve. So in 2011, I began uh, I launched a research project called the African Water Cities Project, uh, which looked at the intersection of rapid urbanization and climate change in African cities. And we identified 20, top 20 African water cities that are, uh, affected by it and we began researching one city uh, a year uh, and in different locations with uh, different institutions. Uh, so we uh, researched Dar es Salaam uh, and Lagos uh, with the Cornell University students. So I'll take a, 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 a group of students and a studio course to one of these cities and we would meet people, would engage with the environment, would look around and we ask what the challenges are. And we see, and each student develops a project. They find the project. They do some re desktop research about the city, but we don't make assumptions before we go and we meet people. And we learn from them and we ask questions and we build relationships. Um, and then we develop ideas around what could be, uh, you know, potential um, opportunities and values and solutions to those uh, cities. Um, we've done that at uh, 
Columbia, Harvard, and Princeton in, in three consecutive years, and um, they've been really interesting experiences. In Africa, like I mentioned, there are several cities that are emerging, and you know, they, uh, they are settlements that somehow almost feel like they are the initial birthplaces of cities, you know, like um, the DNA of cities. This is really how cities grow. And uh, so to me, there are sources of inspiration that when you really think about, if you really want to understand these cities are where you have the richest source of environments. If they are really, really living in coexistence with their uh, environment. Um, and thought we could learn from them. And that's how a lot of the work that we're doing on Water Cities uh, is founded upon. Uh, but many cities in Africa and Asia are actually quite underprepared. Uh, we have challenges of housing, sanitation, public facilities, infrastructure, and so many things. Uh, but it gives us this opportunity to think differently, um, to learn to build differently, and hopefully to live uh, differently. And that was found, that started in a community in Lagos called Makoko for me um, in 2011 again, when I was researching uh, affordable housing to deal with the issues of urbanization in Lagos. And I, I you know, I had uh, re, um, contact with the Lagos state government and I asked them if what I could help with, they said housing. And um, I began this work researching because I thought if I could learn from people who had built so much out of so little, uh, people who are building the, the cheapest dwellings, maybe you know we could improve or we definitely have an insight to how the basic thing could be and we'll deal with the challenges that they have. This is a, a home in Makoko, you know, this is, you know, call it a, uh, Makoko you could, is classif would be classified as a slum and a slum on water and the basic with no infrastructure. Uh, but a, a person who, this man who lives here um, still has almost everything he needs to be, to have, you know, to have this house or the home. Um, he has the basic building block of any society. And this is really powerful that with very, very scarce resources, very scarce resources, limited um, equipment, he's just able, they're able to create this thing. And not just one, but thousands of these, in a way, almost modular structures that have been sort of designed or not even designed in that sort of formal way. So we sought out to kind of understand what drives cities and developments beyond design and um, architecture as we know it in let's say our formal education, um, but really to understand the factors that really, really affect the decision for something to be built or to be um, reconstructed, right? And for us to build our environments and for us to build cities. Um, I think, the first is people, just demographics, right? Where you have, when there's people, when you understand the people, then that's very important. So we developed these seven decima factors, which is what I'm going to explain now. And decima being an acronym for demographics, economics, social politics, infrastructure, morphology, environment, and resources. Uh, and these are seven factors that we think are key drivers for developments. And, um, demographics is about people, economics about, you know, relationships, which are both financial, but really on an economical level. Um, social politics, um, social issues and political context that drive change, infrastructure, morphology, environments, and resources. Um, I'm just going to take you through the development of Makoko floating system which is sort of a very um, uh, a, co a consistent thread that um, 
I, was, I mentioned at the start of the talk that I really appreciate uh, the recognition of this thread um, because it exemplifies the issues that I mentioned in terms of looking at demographic issues, understanding the environment and resources, producing it into architecture and, and hopefully something that can be expanded to um, uh, address challenges of communities and cities. So Makoko floating system uh, is really a simple way to build on water. That's one way to look at it. And perhaps to say it's a simple way to build on water by hand is also something that we're putting in there. It began with a simple idea of um, creating a floating platform um, to address, to improve on the a building system which is based on stilts um, that is fixed and not very adaptable to uh, tidal changes. Um, and we created this first platform using materials that are local and just recycled plastic barrels that you found in the neighborhood. And the idea of the plastics actually came to me when I saw these kids floating uh, across their little community on this recycled plastic barrel. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, then you can use it. Yeah, where did you guys get that? And I'm like, oh, they're like, oh, you know, somewhere down the road. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. And you realize that, of course, Lagos is a city that brings in, uh, it's a port city, and you have all these barrels that are used for uh, different um, shipments, and you can get them used. Um, and the community itself is a sawing and uh, is a sawmill, has a sawmill next to it, right next to it. So they get all this wood and a lot of the recycled wood is what they use to build their homes. So we had source of wood and we had source of uh, plastic barrels for flotation and created this simple idea of floating. And the kids just jumped right on it. So it's like, wow, you know, party time. Um, and we then, the, the, with the community developed an idea of a floating structure that is um, a rigid frame on these plastic barrels. And that rigid frame um, was broken down to very simple elements that uh, you could find and manufacture locally, but you know, bringing it together to create a three floor building and a three floor building in the, in the shape of a, of a pyramid or a triangle, a prism, um, has a low center of gravity. So it's actually really good for uh, stability uh, for a floating object when it comes to this low, the higher you go, uh, um, the low center of gravity. So we then created this uh, timber bamboo uh, recycled plastic barrel thing, which was in really like a minimum viable product because we built it at a time where the community was being threatened for demolition. They were actually demolishing the community. And we said, well, let's show that, well, if we could solve some of the problems and there's a way of building, we can improve the quality of the environment. It was nowhere near perfect. It was in fact, just something that started making the community around it, you know, a little bit more perfect. It was like, bringing, attracting people to it, attracting interest, attracting, uh, but also um, showing the possibilities of what could be and what was different and bringing hope and bringing, uh, lifting the spirits of, of, of the people, uh, giving a sense of security that, okay, we have. Um, but it, it was always an idea for us to, uh, create a prototype that is really a catalyst um, for innovation and adaptation uh, to the changing climate, but also about education, but not education just in terms of the school. It's not, that was just a, a incidental function, um, which was a, a pilot demonstration of the capacity of a a built infrastructure that could serve many things from housing, from a home to you know, a school, to a healthcare center, to 
you know, hospitality to culture to, you know, and all kinds of things. How can you build, with a, create a very simple way to build on water that could adapt to these different things. Macro floating system, which we nickname MFS, is just made of wood, some steel components, and some flotation device. Um, the first MFS was this was like sort of a, a, a an interesting partnership and relationship with the community. This guy is the uh, one of the carpenters that built many of those homes that you saw, and he was he's teaching me everything about wood and how to build and you know, using short spans and, you know, like really we had a great time and also challenging time, difficult times like, or, you know, um, but really created um, something together where, you know, we're constantly working, bringing expertise from different parts, testing things, you know, uh, throwing it into an environment and seeing how people react to it, looking at ways of uh, keeping things together, producing. So we had a really great time having fun, playing while at it, you know, and built this three floors floating structure on recycled plastic barrels, 156 of them. Even before the thing was completed, people were having a great time on the structure and the parties and the fun that they had in this floating system was just incredible. And we kept watching it, learning from it, you know, re making repairs, you know, discussing, you know, really, really engaging, finding new solutions, testing toilet types, testing, you know, literally working with the community, giving us ideas that, oh, this is how they deal with things like this. This is what they do. You know, understanding was an incredible test ground, an incredible learning platform for, um, developing a way that was within the community's capacity, means local uh, local skills, resources to create um, with the right conditions. Now, these conditions are never always completely perfect, but when you start something, you begin to make create influence. And that's what Marco Co Floating School was at the first iteration as a pilot, which was this space that began something and began bring, engaging the discourse of how you could build differently in that environment. A lot of people think about it as a school and I still get people asking me, so how many, how many schools have you built? And I'm like, well, you know, maybe it is a school um, really because it's like a, school of fish right um but it's also really just a school that we hope changes and teaches and people can learn from it about the relationship between cities and the water because it was actually also support it was funded by the united nations development program and the federal ministry of environment under the africa adaptation program so it was always been about climate change adaptation. And we had always thought about this as a project to start this discourse and not only think about it, but do it. You know, just do it, test it, see how it works, see, you know, where it fails and uh, improve on it. And that's what we did. Black Oko was in, actively used for many years in different ways and different relations. It had a lot of impacts, even as a structure. Uh, already was been, it's been talked about in the, in the discourse of climate change and the rise floating architecture. Uh, we've seen a lot of people also, you know, learn and become, uh, take their own initiatives. Um, and in 2000, 16, three, th three years after we built the first one, we had the opportunity to build a second one, which was now a set prototype two called MFS2. Uh, nowhere but in Venice, the city of water, and a great opportunity to uh, work at the Venice Biennale, where we were invited to do a, to, to do a project. Um, and it was such a, a great moment. 
where we produced what was handcrafted in a you know in a very very simple way but standardizing those elements and creating something that was even uh, prefab so you can just have a pack you can you know and assemble and disassemble it um, this is it sort of going through the city and it's docked it was docked in the arsenal uh, um, and use so it was sort of a prefab structure that um, you know we began sort of modularizing the systems even a lot more uh, looking at sizes of things, the number of days it takes people to build it. Um, because when you start to think at scale, you need to keep the system very simple and very elemental and, and um, also repetitive to a large extent, but you have the capacity to also change and adapt to different uh, configurations. So we built a third one in um, Belgium, in Bruges, in this beautiful lake of love, Mina floating school, we call it. Mina means love. So it's a love floating school. Um, and uh, we worked with, uh, you know, some of the best engineers always from the start to sort of really help us make sure this is not just, I mean, it's engineered, it's safe, it's, it works, it meets building requirements and codes. And in 2018, we built the third iteration um, with working with uh, ACOM, which is a large engineering firm, um, and other partners that are like super yacht builders, uh, Dijkstra, and so many other people, to even modularize the system and create connections that are uh, also very repetitive. So. This became a much more bolted system um, where you just sort of put all these things together and you, it, the wood is all pre-cut. And it was also used as a school um, with uh, um, children also learning organized programs and also creating their own floating schools but this time even more ambitious towers, floating towers. Really, really exciting. All the modular system, I think it's still, still there. It's beautiful, I thought. Um, and the same year, we also got the opportunity to build the, the, fourth, uh, of the yeah, fourth prototype, um, which is, it was in China, and that gave us the opportunity to scale it uh, from a small, from one to two to three structures. So what we did was we took the modular system of MFS, the original large version, which has three floors, and we created two floors and one floor version from it. So that produces a small, a medium, and a large, which was what we built in uh, China. And of course, with Chinese expertise in production, mass production, fabrication, such a great learning curve also. And this was all built in like three months. Um, and that was it with lights. So um, MFS is a, you know, it's a versatile uh, floating building system for housing, education, hospitality, healthcare. Um, it's something that it's, it's currently has three sizes with several variations, but it's essentially a small, medium, and a large size uh, on one, two, and three floors. But you can also use a three floor building as a huge hall and to create like a complete open space, or you can have mezzanines within it. So you can, you know, reconfigure the interiors uh, differently. There are different versions of it. You can use it for single multi housing units. Uh, you know, different levels, living, kitchen, bedroom, bathrooms. Uh, you can lay it out like that. You can, um, it's also really thought through in terms of, you know, green economy and material resource and sourcing and that you can recycle it essentially. Um, I will finalize, the, I'll finish the presentation um, by just showing a bit more on our latest um, 
version, which is in Cape Verde, uh, a prototype 5 MFS4. Uh, Cape Verde is a beautiful island, an archipelago of islands, actually, um, of 10 islands in West Africa. Uh, it's uh, historically the first um, European settlement in Africa. And, uh, um, it used to be a, um, the point of no return for the enslaved uh, people that were taken from most of West Africa and held uh, captive and then uh, taken to the Americas uh, during the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, and in that, that was, it was a period where, you know, in the ships, you know, people would be together and there would be, um, you know, one of the things that kept the captains together um, was the songs of freedom. And that's where a lot of the genre of music, as you know, even in New Orleans uh, came from. Um, and Cape Verde was, it's a city of music. Uh, beautiful few place, uh, people, uh, the landscape is incredible. The environment is amazing. It's architecture is, you know, very, uh, has a European uh, Portuguese uh, look, uh, but the environment is also very, very diverse and, um, and, the sort of thread of culture of music is very strong and they have carnivals. It's very, you know, New Orleans and, and Louisiana. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the culture in, in, in these areas are, um, uh, you know, really, really synonymous with uh, Cape Verde. Um, it's about history. Um, it's about culture. And I think the water, as a, an element in Cape Verde with 99% of its surface area being water is a very strong theme. So we also then used, we, so we created, used the MFS to create a floating music hub, which uh, is a way sort of a, a way to bring people together, especially from the African diaspora uh, back to the continent using music, dance, art, film, uh, fashion, the creative industries. Um, and also using these three vessels um, like a point of return. Um, they become these vessels of return uh, but for the production of and performance of music and other creative arts um, for Africans and talents in Africa and the diaspora uh, to come collaborate and you know, with people locally and internationally. And uh, so the construction uh, was really at, um, suited for that system. We had a large vessel, which would be a performance hall as the medium vessel was, uh, is a recording studio and the small vessel is a bar all sort of centered around a plaza. Um, and th that plaza becomes this sort of uh, performance space uh, while the inside is also a live studio. Um, this is it under construction, as you see. Um, you know, this was also, I think the structural frame was put up uh, in three weeks just before COVID lockdown. Um, and uh, they've, you know, they've made progress, sort of continued working the frame was completed you see it's in a bay it's a beautiful bay uh, in the island of mindelo or, or of uh, south vicente in mindelo south vicente uh, and it's got this great landscape and you know suddenly these form this um, mfs forms also have a interesting relationship with with um yeah the context uh and I've been there for over about a month now. I just got back from Cape Verde when we're completing the structure. Um, and, you know, that's just like, like lights coming through the back of it. Uh, you know, the, the large space captures lights. We were picking the colors of uh, Cape Verde, um, you know, the light blue, pastel beautiful colors of the city and also the um, shingled roofs um, to sort of 
make it like part of the architecture brought to the waterfront. Uh, and that's me there. And um, so that's our, you know, we've built it and it, I mean, in Cape Verde is an ocean. So it's also sort of a, a new frontier, really. Uh, Cape Verde has one of the highest wind speeds, almost hurricane speed. So it also allowed us to test and push the technology forward and really make it more resilient and, uh, uh, and robust uh, and bringing new technologies or really high technologies inside like a recording studio. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, next step that we're taking the system um, to. So um, uh, this is one, one, one thing, one element, one entity in the very complex narrative of creating cities that work with water. But I'm, I'm, bring, I'm sharing this because I think we all have a great responsibility to think of one at the very least, and particularly as architects, of something that you can create and test and improve and, and, and hopefully it's useful for the world out there in our um, yeah, natural evolution to uh, live with uh, humanity and uh, bring humanity and the environment into uh, coexistence. Um, I, uh, I'll end with a one minute video of uh, MFS uh, that just captures the narrative and uh, Thank you so much for your attention and time. Thank you, Mr. Adeyemi. That was great. Tracy, would you like to moderate the uh, q and A? It looks like we have uh, at least four questions here, so we're getting some good uh, feedback in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, thank you so much for that presentation. It's really fantastic and um, I'm going to let leave this for the question and answer, but uh, we we in South Louisiana also have a very long tradition of living on water and living in structures that are handmade. Um, you know, south of us, that there's a very strong culture for that, and it's it's interesting to see new technologies and new ways of doing it as we ourselves contemplate moving away from that coast. And then we spend a lot of time with having that conversation about how to maintain life in those places where the culture is so rich uh, and the resources are plenty, uh, but we need to really think really how we do that. Um, so I have asked several of our students to actually help leading with leading the Q&A session. Um, I'm gonna start out, uh, they, they have some questions and then uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Naomi because she's uh, right in front of me on the screen. Um, and I'm also going to ask her after she asks her question, ask the first one on the Q&A list, if you don't mind. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is more, I did some research about you and your works previously. So I had more of a question. In an interview with Architizer, you spoke about how architecture architects need to become more servant to society. 
and how they must address the needs of the average person. So how can we as students and beginning designers address these concerns within already established practices that tend to focus up more on like the high end and more privileged aspects of design? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's a good question. Um, I think, um, you know, within every one of us, we have um, some, res we have resources and we have capacity. And those capacities do not really have to be um, a lot. They don't have to be um, invested into through um, you know large corporations or but they, there's a there's a seed in each one of us that can contribute to this uh, question that you raise and how do we serve society and within you find what moves you what is what you find interesting and not only think about it, but take some action and, you know, believe in it and continue to improve on it and continue to uh, be open minded about that idea. Uh, and, and I think you would find your space and that's, that's how you should take it. You should take it from an individual level. What is the capacity and resources within your means? And who are you dealing with? with the, the demographics. Who, what, what infrastructure do you have to to work with? And don't think about infrastructure you want, but what do you have? Um, what, you know, what is the environment that you're working in? Answer those questions, and I think you would be on a good start. Thank you. And so the other question is. Um, someone said, hi, I'm curious about how the Makoka system stays in the same place in the water. Does it move with the water? And what about if the sea or the river moves too much like in a storm? What happens to the system? <laughs> it's such a beautiful question because it's one of the most important questions of, um, yeah, of any floating object, right? How does it stay, you know? It's a very easy thing to float an object, right? You just, you know, an object floats because it displaces an amount of water equals, it, that is equal to its own weight. So, you know, if you can create something that can displace an amount of water that equals the weight, you float an object, it's very easy. But to keep it in position and to keep it um, stable, um, you also just ask some of the very basic questions like how do you keep uh, like floating objects that we know that are large and stable like a boat you anchor it so you just need to develop an anchor um and then you ask how do you keep it stable then you start to think about what provides the best stability so in our case we figured that triangular frame with a low center of gravity, especially if you're looking tall, a three floor building um, has stability, just natural stability. Um, so in the storm, there are different levels of storm, different levels of waves. Then it gets into more complex engineering, understanding the capacities that you're dealing with, the kinds of connections that will keep its resilience within that. And then you start to engineer it for different levels of capacity. So are you talking hurricane speed? Are you talking just a regular storm? Are you talking a little bit of wave on the water? Are you talking about winds that are high? How many knots? So that gets into more complex engineering, which are all very resolvable. And uh, that's a journey that you take. You ask very simple questions, very simple solutions, and then you evolve it. Thank you. 
All righty. I am going to um, have Mustafa ask the next question since he's so generously letting me use his laptop right now. So I'll turn the computer to him. Also, hey. Hey. hey, how's All it going? Right. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Mustafa Hamid. I'm a, a fourth year architecture student and I'm also a president of NOMAS, which is a service club here. Um, and the question that I had was, so coming from New Orleans, we especially this year we've gotten like 45 hurricanes and uh, so how does like something like that where there's an increase of frequency and strength in hurricanes how do those affect the the, the, the implementation of the water city that's a, that's a question uh, i think you know I think there's an echo so. oh. maybe we need to thank you yeah okay um it's a it's a good question, and there, uh, you know, that gets into the engineering real, um, and we always, you know, you always design for capacities anyway, um, and even for buildings on land, you you engineer them to certain capacities, and you know that after a certain limits, the structure can fail, or the, there might be these kinds of risks um, within capacity so you and those capacities are usually based on regulations and codes because they've been examined but some are really just based on experience there in those environments so you need to learn from the environment and understand the history uh, understand the social conditions and the environmental history and projection so um, take for instance the um, Many cities are now being as projected to be at the risk of, let's say, uh, a, a one meter sea level rise. And there's an implication to that. But there's also, uh, there are also potential implications to, with like wind speeds. So some cities are beginning to see higher wind speeds. Um, and, you know, there are meteorological services there are all kinds of data that show what the future um, projections are and you design to those capacities and um, you know we're all dealing with different scenarios but these are worst worst case scenarios that are being projected um, but there are some things that are just really standard that you know there's frequency floods frequency this you know, and, um, and that's what you look out for. Uh, I, I think you're muted. <laughs> you're muted. <laughs> that's like, you know, you're not giving us a chance there. Mustafa. <laughs> uh, well, I said thank you for the response. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, the, uh, we have a question from Mendiza who says, uh, all, we all know that there's a lot of political turmoil in African countries. Uh, what role do you think ar architecture plays in addressing these issues? Yeah. Um, we investigate that question under our social political register. Um, and we realize that these, that politics and social issues are very, very serious drivers of development. Um, we see developments happening in cycles of governments, four-year cycles, and there are patterns to it sometimes. We see changing governments affecting the growth or some, sometimes the, um, you know, the slow down of development. Um, and uh, so indeed, that's a very good question. Because how can architecture, how can development, you know, play a role in that? I think um, you know social and 
governments, so social um, situation, circumstances, uh, political turmoils, um, unrests are, are driven by um, many factors. And I, I would say one of the key implications is that they always have an impact on the environment, whether the environment comes better or worse. Um, I think we must understand that whatever, if we as architects can create solutions that are resilient to these changes and these adaptation that people need and these also inspiration for how they want to live and to ensure that they can live safely, then I think there might be a knock-on effect, a positive one on even, yeah, the political and social behaviors of people in that environment. So I think we have a huge role. We have a huge role to play. We have a tremendous role in using architecture as a catalyst for change. Alrighty, um, we have, we're, we're running short on time. So I'm gonna say we have time for two more questions. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Cecilia Lee, go ahead, please introduce yourself as well. And then um, after that, I'll have Lauren Cantu go. Hi, I'm Cece, I'm a fifth year architecture student. Um, I just wanted to ask, could you speak a little bit um, of any other projects or development that you're currently working on? and how your work or other work have influenced you and like led you to them. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so we're working on a couple of projects now. Um, I mean, the, the uh, floating music hub in, in Mindelo is, is one that is live and is on site. Uh, we are uh, increasing we're building more um, uh, schools and we're building, um, I'd say more uh, infrastructure within the Black Rhino Academy that we did in Tanzania. Um, so that's sort of expanding. It's a master plan that began with some classrooms or building a school hall. We're building, you know, so we're building a school in Tanzania. Um, and that's on land. It's got, it's got very little to do with water in the sense of water city. Um, we're working on a new performance space for uh, Roskilde Festival, which is in Denmark. Um, and that's also sort of a, an interesting modular iteration um, of uh, one of our works. Um, and we're working on um, several things that are also maybe uh, on land specifically we, we're working on a new project in Tanzania building some healthcare and educational facilities um, and uh, where uh, and a lot of these works have, have influenced by our engagement with projects uh, that are in, let's say, challenging environments. And uh, I would say some of them, yeah, some of them are not. Maybe you, know, you might describe Denmark not as a challenging environment, but we still keep the spirit of the projects uh, very simple. So in a way, what we learn from these places, uh, we try to bring them back. And even if we produce a very complex structure, uh, it is through simple means. Um, and I think that's partly because of my experience uh, um, at OMA, having dealt with large-scale complex projects like Shenzhen Stock Exchange, a 40-story tower with like, you know, 30 meter, meter cantilever, um, you know, Qatar National Library, it's a 100 by 100 meter huge um, library space uh, with technologies moving, you know, 
book movers, book retrievers, and you know, um, and um, trying to reduce all that knowledge into uh, uh, where I would say I, it all began for me uh, in Nigeria, where I grew up with a father who was uh, whose father was a farmer. So my grandfather was a farmer, and my father became a uh, was an architect. So, um, and I lived in an environment where architecture, you know, he was a modernist architect. He started one of the first indigenous, indigenous firms in Northern Nigeria, in Kaduna, north of, uh, yeah, sort of in a much drier place than Lagos that's very wet, right? Um, and in Kaduna, my father had a home that he would always sort of experiment with and add a room, build organically. But we also had a farm. So I lived with in an environment where it was both, you know, architecture and the built environment, but also farm. So I would say uh, maybe I'm like third generation of uh, an architect and a farmer because my father was an architect and a farmer. So I'm, you know, um, an architect maybe that things like a farmer and uh, yeah so that's the influence that I think ties uh, you know my experience my, my you know and, and our current works and where we're trying to uh, go with this we you know we're still this is all work in progress for my, myself and my team at Tengli and uh, we're we're always learning we're always interested in collaborating and finding new challenges. We don't do a lot, but we just try to make sure we, um, what we do has a great impact. Thank you. <laughs> and we, Lauren, would you like to ask the last question? Yeah. Um, so what would the first response like to them as like response like I can't hear. Right. Yeah, we're having trouble. You're you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, my Wi-Fi is not doing great. So there you go. It's better. Okay. Um, I was wondering what the response was like from the public, depending on what city you were in, like if there was a differing response. Um, I think, I think, um, yeah, there are different responses, but there's always been, I think in, in all the locations that we've had them, um, it's, you know, it's, it's triggered interest. It's been something different. It's, it's um, you know, it triggered curiosity. Uh, it's something that people um, are inspired by. They, you know, um, they, it, it sort of makes sense to them. Like, oh yeah, actually, you know, we could do that. Yeah, you know. Um, and they, they've been used for different reasons and different purposes. So that's also had different influences, I would say. Um, and they've also been in different environments uh, from a lagoon to a lake to an ocean front. Um, so, and different, you know, built it now in five countries across three continents. Um, we're actually gonna build one in the US uh, and we had started building it in um, LA, the most unsuspecting place you'd think, right? How would you build a floating structure in Los Angeles? <laughs> but it was actually, um, we're invited to, do a, a, to build it in West Lake, one of the lakes that you have in, 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 uh, in MacArthur Park, uh, working with. Uh, uh, a group called uh, Mad Workshop. And um, 
So that was also a place where, but that stopped unfortunately um, due to COVID and we had to, so we literally had brought the one from um, Belgium. We had disassembled it, put it in a, in a container and we shipped it to LA and we re were reassembling it to, uh, yeah, to launch it in the West Lake. Um, and also, so the response to that was also really great. A lot of excitement, students were, were working with the USC, um, even, you know, before it stopped, there was excitement growing. Um, so it's different, it's been very, very different, but I think in all, there's a positive response um, and, and I think, you know, people always find it beautiful. Alrighty, and with thank that, um, thank you for taking some extra time with us. Um, and we've gone over our time a little bit, but I right. wanna say thank you tremendously for this presentation. Um, and uh, again, thank you for everybody. Thank you to everybody for who dialed in today, because this, as mentioned, was the first of the lecture series this year, and it was a fantastic turnout. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right.